All right. Now, as we continue our nine-week journey into the uh, book of Mark, uh, last week, Cass, I spoke, and we, we're not going through the whole book. We're going through different snippets and different stories of the book of Mark. It's a really complex book, and it's a really awesome book that we could spend a lot more time on, but we just want to pick out a few different stories and a few different things and themes in there, which we think are really cool and important. So today we're going to uh, look at a story. Uh, it's, it's almost what they call a Mark sandwich. There's one, two ends of a story, and there's a big story in the middle as well. So you think one story is going to happen, and all of a sudden someone else comes along into the picture, comes in, and then they deal with that, and then, another st- and then the end of the story happens. Now, we dealt with it a few weeks ago with the summer series when we had a video. Um, one of the... One of the, the Speakers, which one was it, Matt? Judah Smith. And I think we've still got the link on that on our Facebook page. So if you want to see a great sermon on the passage that we're looking at that, go look at that one. And also watch this one again. <laughs> it's a great sermon as well. But <laughs> look back at the other one as well and have a look at that one as well from Judah Smith. It was really, really cool. So I'm going to take a slightly different take on it uh, tonight. It's a big passage we're going to look at tonight. So before... Instead of reading it, I've got a, a dramatised video of it. So, but if you do want to follow it on your own Bible, it's from Mark chapter 5, 21 to 43. But we're going to watch this, this person read it out uh, from, I found on the net. So we'll sit back and have a look at it. A fairly big chunk, as, he, as we said. It's a start of the story. We pick Jairus, he's waiting at the shore and the boat comes in and tells Jesus that oh, my daughter's going to die, can you save me? Walking along and then the middle story comes in with a woman who had the bleeding problem for 12 years and then it goes back to Jairus' story. So I want to touch on the, um, the, the woman's story first and, and we'll deal with that one because and, and uh, I think it's really cool and then it ends with the other one. And, and so I want to start off with a bit of an illustration from home, which I always love to have. Now, living with two young kids, uh, there's, and over the Christmas holidays and summer holidays, there's always a uh, plethora of sermon illustrations that come out of having the kids at home. And there was one that was sort of relevant to this story. My two-year-old was watching... Uh, I was in charge of looking after my two-year-old for an afternoon which is always a good thing. <laughs> I think it is. It's good fun. Um, depending on how long it goes for, if it's a short period of time, it's great fun because we get to play. But if it's a long period of time, we still play. But then sometimes I'll go, I'll put on an episode of Play School and I'll go to the office and do some work. And so it was one of these occasions where this was happening. So we had a bit of a play beforehand and then we decided, OK, you can watch Play School for half an hour. I'll come and check on you and then we'll be fine. Lo and behold, this was happening, and so put play school on. It was one of his favourite episodes when he was singing all these songs. And I'm away doing my work in the, near my computer, and it's great. I have a listen to what he's doing, and you can hear him singing along to the songs, which is always kind of cute. It's always good. Uh, I can't stop but sing along too sometimes. Uh, but it's really cool. But then all of a sudden, the singing had stopped, and there was this big crash. I thought, oh, no, what had happened? This two-year-old had gone. So I'd rushed out from my computer from my office, and then went to the back room where he was watching television. There was toys on the floor and no Thomas. I thought, oh no, what's happened here? But I heard crying, I heard whimpering, so I thought, it's not as bad as what it could be, but it's still bad, but it's not as bad as what it could be, because I can still hear Thomas. And so I I just followed the, the cries and followed the whimpers. I moved to his bedroom, and I looked in there, and I couldn't see him. But I could hear, as I said, I could still hear him crying and whimpering. And what he had done, like he had gotten behind the bed and stuck his arm up and crying. And he could hear me coming because I was calling out, Thomas, are you okay? Tom, are you okay? And he's crying and he's, he's out like this, he's crying. And he's put his arm out. And I thought it was cute as well, <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I thought, oh, shall I save this moment or shall I actually go to him? No, I went to him. And I consulted. And what must have happened is that they got to a Humpty Dumpty song, and he tried to get his Humpty Dumpty toy off the shelf, pulled down the rest of his toys. The toy must have hit him on the arm. He got scared by it, went running to his bedroom, and started crying and put his arm out like that. 
Now, I'm not too sure why he started crying and put his arm out like that. He might have been scared because I might have been going to growl him for pulling all the toys down, or he just might have been scared because it was a big fright for him. He might have been hurt. But here he was, cut, tucked up against his bed where I couldn't see him, but his arm was out like that. So I picked him up. I said, Thomas, it's OK. I gave him a big cuddle, and I said, OK, let's go out and watch. So we went out there and watched Humpty Dumpty songs and sang it together. It was kind of a good moment after that. <laughs> but, as I said, he was hanging out there. He had his arm like that, and he was almost like he was too ashamed or too afraid to, to talk to him. And I see, I sense this sort of, same sort of, reminded me what happened in this story with the woman. That the woman was there for a long time. Now, she had a problem of bleeding for 12 years or so. And she believed so hard that she was going to get healed, but it took her a lot of courage to do that. It took her a lot of faith to do that. Now, a bit of history behind the woman there. Now, in those days... Um, it wasn't like today. It wasn't like we had lots of doctors uh, and, and medical people that can heal people and tell people what to do. And in fact, society was a lot different because if you had medical issues, you weren't just accepted into the community and trying, oh, we'll help you, we'll heal you. You were shunned away. You were pushed away. You were saying that you were unclean. I don't want to hang out with you. You've got warts, you're bleeding, you're whatever. You're unclean. I don't want to hang out with you. And not only that, you have to, the back in the law, the law of Moses, she was supposed to keep a distance and shout, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine that? All of a sudden you're walking along and hear unclean and one of your friends saying unclean. That'd be pretty bad. Like, hey, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. You just stay a distance, things like that. So that's what it was like back in that day. And so this woman would have been having to do this for 12 years. A long time she was cut off from society. She was felt unworthy, lonely, isolated or hurt. And when Jesus appeared on the scene, something began to well in her. Something thought, well, Jesus can help me. I've been to all these other doctors, I've been to all these other physicians, nothing's been able to help me, but Jesus might be able to help me. And even though the law says stay back from Jewish leaders, stay back away from the people, I have the faith that this person is going to heal me. And perhaps he might have heard what he'd been doing beforehand, or he might have just, this was the last straw of faith, but she had faith that this could heal her. And in verse 28, let me put it on. In verse 28, it says, For she said, um, she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And Matthew does a cool way of doing it. He says, she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. I get this picture in my head that she's repeating it to herself, that she's psyching herself up and saying, hey, if only I do this, this is, this is going to be great. If I have faith in God. I can do this. I can heal. She, he can heal me. And it's like how we always psych ourselves up and we always talk to ourselves and we play that conversation out in our own head before we actually have it with someone else. I get that sense of what this woman is doing here. So she's being shunned away from society. She's probably in a corner waiting for Jesus to come. All these people crowd around. Jairus is there, gets in first and says, hey, come with me. My daughter is unwell, so you come to me. So Jesus starts walking. She's still over there in the corner. She's thinking, she's psyching herself up, talking to herself, and if only I touch him, I'll be healed. So obviously this woman has immense faith. There are so many people around it that he has to push his way, th she has to push her way through to get through to him. Now, I don't know, I think I've told this story before, but I love going along to music festivals. And a few years ago, about five, six years ago, I went to the big day out, and the headlining act was Rage Against the Machine. And I, I liked them, but they were, they were a massive band. It was like 35 degree heat that day. And so they were the last band on, and so I'd work myself way to way to get to the, near to the front so I could get a good posse and get, I'd get to see them when they came, come out. And so the band came on and everything, they came out and everyone was erupting and we got pushed forward and it was great fun, but it was the 35 degree heat. And they're like, oh, I'm a big man myself, but jumping around in that heat, I couldn't take it for that long. I'm seriously, after about 10 minutes, I just thought, oh, I have to get out of there. 
I have to get moved to the back. I still want to see them. I still want to see the band, but I have to move back. And so I'm pushing against all these other guys, trying to, and girls, trying to push myself away. All of a sudden, the lead singer jumps and stage dives on the, uh, on the crowd. Imagine what happened then. Everyone pushes forward because they want to touch him and get closer to him. So here I am trying to go backwards, and they're pushing me forwards, and people are, are scrambling and going forwards, and it was like a pressure cooker. It was really, really Now, eventually, I got out. I watched the rest of the band from the, the side of the stage, which was really cool, but it was really pushing hard against people. And I'm guessing you might have been in a similar situation when listening to a band or at a show or something like that, and this is what it would have been like in Jesus' day. This is what it would have been like when people were flocking to see him. People pushing from everywhere. And it says people were pushing to try and get closer to Jesus. And yet this old woman, or this woman who's been having medical issues for a long time, has the guts and determination and the faith to push through the crowd to try and get closer to Jesus. Has the faith to think, okay, this person can actually heal me. This person can do something for me. So she gets there and touches him. Jesus stops because she's been healed. Jesus stops and says, whoa, power has left for me. What's happening? Who has touched me? And the disciples and Jairus are going far out. (laughs) Everyone's touching you, man. Everyone's getting close. You don't know. And then Jesus says, no, no, no. Someone purposely touched me and wanted to heal and there must have been a moment of silence because he's looking around, the disciples are going, but everyone's touching you. And he's looking around, thinking what's going on. And there's a time in between hand before the woman falls down to her feet. So there's a moment of silence where, again, the woman is still thinking to herself, oh, what am I going to do now? I know I'm healed, but do I own up? Do I fess up? So that moment of fear, like, like almost where Thomas was when he was on the bed trying to whimper there, looking for a feeling, looking for someone to support him, this woman was in the same situation. Until she falls down to her feet, trembling with fear, it says, and says, God, it was me, and told her the whole story. And this is, well, your faith has made you better. Your faith, the faith that you had to come all this way, the faith that you have had to make your way through the crowd, the faith that you have had to pull on your garment, the faith that you have had all this time has made you better. That's the first, that's the middle part of the story. That this old woman shunned away from society, told that she's unclean, gets healed by the faith that she has. So take on that for a second there. Have you ever been too afraid to talk to Jesus about something in your heart? You mean to think that Jesus can't help me with this? Jesus can't help me with this. It's been happening for so long. Each one of us has that moment sometimes when something's been welling in our heart for some time that we are struggling with or on our mind that we just can't shake. Or we think, oh, Jesus doesn't want to deal with that. Maybe it's too small for him. Or maybe, you know, I'll just live with it for the rest of my life. We all have those moments ourselves. But this woman had the faith to do something about it and actually give it to God, give it up to God. So that's the middle part of the story. But what about Jairus? What sort of faith did he show? See, Jairus was a synagogue leader. And in those days, a synagogue leader was royalty. Was, was well, not royalty, but the, the top of the pop sort of stuff there. He was you know, the centre of religion, the centre of town, Things would go through me. He would know what would happen. He would have servants around him. He would know what was going on. He has faith that he would heal his daughter. He's at his death. The daughter is at the deathbed. So he would have been like the woman waiting for Jesus to come, waiting at the boat, waiting, making his way through the people for Jesus to come. Sits it, stands at the boat, the boat comes in, he's the first one. He would have had to push through a few people and say, hey, Jesus, I'm here. Save my daughter. You can do it. I know you can. I have faith in you to do it. So he was determined as well. Now, as I said, I've got two kids myself. 
and I'll do anything for my two kids. And, and we've had a pretty good trot with them, but the youngest one, Tom, has had a few stints in hospital. And one time in particular, he had to spend like two or three days in hospital before his first birthday. And so Linda and I would take turns to stay with him, even though it was just a minor operation that most children would have had, um, but it was still dawning for, for one of your own kids to have to go through that. So we wanted to be by his bedside the whole time. And so we would take it in turns when she had enough, I would go there and then I would come home and she would stand overnight there. So we wanted to be by his bedside. So can you imagine how Jairus would have been feeling? His own daughter is by his deathbed. If it was mine, I wanted to spend the most time with her as possible. But again, Jairus is a man of faith. Jairus is a man that says, hey, Jesus, this man can heal her. This man, this son of God can heal my daughter. So I'm going to go to him to do it. Now, someone could have sent, like he's one of his servants or a friend to say, hey, you know, Jairus' daughter's really sick, can you look after him? But Jairus wanted to do it himself. Jairus wanted, had the faith that he thought, well, I want to do it, I'm going to do it. So here he is clutching at straws, but still determined that Jesus will be able to heal her. So Jesus leads Jairus along. And all of a sudden, it stops. And that woman touches him and Jesus turns around. And Jairus is part of that conversation saying, or oh, part of the conversation where he's asking, who touched me? Now, it says only the disciples said, who touched me? And or only the disciples said, oh, everyone's pushing around you. Jairus, it didn't say Jairus and the disciples. It says the disciples did it. If it was me, I would have been saying that too. I would have been saying, if I was Jairus, I would have been saying, Jesus, move along. Everyone's touching you. Let's go. I'm come to my daughter. Save them. You know, you, know, you can talk to other one else any other time. But Jairus just stands there. We don't get a response from Jairus. And in fact, we don't know how long Jesus was standing there for, but during that time, some of Jairus' friends come up to Jairus and says, look, your daughter's already dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Let's go home. Let's go somewhere else. Let's mourn. Let's let, let Jesus have some other time. But overhearing this, and the next, next passage over here, he was still speaking. Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. And so obviously that would have perked Jairus up a little bit. So yeah, no, no. My faith is strong. Jesus is still with me. Jesus is still with me. So they walk closer to Jairus' home. You don't know how long it's going to be or how far it is, but there's enough time that Jairus' friends are outside the house. They're crying and wailing, saying, no, no, you've missed it. Jairus, your daughter's dead. And when Jesus says, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead. The people around them stop crying and start laughing at Jesus because this is absurd. Now, she's dead. This is not happening. How do you think Jairus would have felt about that? To me, if that happened to me, I would be having mixed emotions. I would be thinking, yeah, I'm with Jesus, but all these people have been telling Jesus is a, is a nutter now because he's saying he's not dead and now they're laughing at me and him. What's going on here? So Jairus is still stuck in this moment, but he has the faith that it's going to see him through. And as we know the end of the story, he walks in there and he says, you're healed and the daughter is healed and everyone's amazed. But it was for the faith of Jairus to put himself out there like the faith of the woman that is going to be healed. See, one thing I love about these stories is that Mark put them together for a purpose. Both of them together for a purpose. And see, one of that purpose is, is the fact that Jesus again shows us, no matter who you are, no matter what rank in society you have, if you have the faith, that I will work with you. I will help you out. See, again, going back into the, the biblical days, the, the, the 
leaders and the people in society were saying, hey, no, no, why are you hanging out with that scum? Come hang out with us. Come hang out with the leaders. You're for us. Yet here he shows that he wasn't just for those people. He was for everyone. He was here for the woman that had been bleeding for 12 years and seemed unclean. But he was also for the synagogue leaders. He was also for the higher people. He's for everyone. He's not just for us. He's just not for the Australians. He's not just for Europeans. He's for everyone. But you have to have the faith to step out and believe in him. So he's looking at the faith rather than the people. See, what happens to us when we go through adversity? What happens to us when we go through hard times? See, I think for us, and and me included in this, we start to listen to those voices inside our head. And maybe they're saying, hey, we're not worthy of being healed by him. We're not worthy of being with Jesus. Or Jesus has got better things to heal than us. Or, in Jairus' case, we're listening to the people around us saying, hey, nah, that's not going to get better. You're not good enough for that. Things are already gone. Like, you can't get healed of that. You can't do this. You can't do that. People around us tell us that sort of stuff. And sometimes we tell ourselves that sort of stuff as well. See, society gets in the way. And Jesus' friends and co-workers, or Jairus' friends and co-workers, were shutting him down and saying, no, no, she's already dead. Don't bother, Don't bother him. The woman around her, society was telling her, no, no, you're unclean. Stay away. But the woman had the faith to see it through. Jesus had the faith to see it through. Jairus had the faith to see it through. She was always building herself up, saying, if only I touch Jesus, if only I do this, if only I had the faith to do it. Jairus had the faith in the, in the face of the worst-case scenario when people said, your daughter's already dead, but he still had faith. Do we think that miracles happen today? Sometimes we just think, oh, they're just in the biblical days. Oh, Jesus can't do stuff like that today. Jesus can't do half of that sort of stuff in my life. That was just in the Bible. But Jesus does do miracles today. And we've all heard stories on our own lives or in other people's lives where it can happen. So why don't we think sometimes that it can happen to us? Again, these other voices go in our head. Sometimes we need to have the faith to step forward and believe that it will happen. Now, for these two stories, it was hard. The woman had to suffer through 12 years of it. Jairus' daughter was on a literal deathbed. We're not too sure how long he was sick beforehand, but it was on the deathbed. So we might think, oh, I have the faith now, but it might not be now when he gets healed. It might be a couple of weeks or months or years down the track. We have to have the faith that, yes, Jesus can work through the situation that I'm in. The problems that I have, I'm not too sure when it will get healed, when it will get better, but I have faith that, God, you are working through it. Just like Jairus did and the woman, because so often we can hear the stories around us and it's hard. But these, these two stories give me a, a great encouragement. It's picked up with that other verse, and I'm not too sure what's happening with this tonight. It is on, but it's not there. So Mark 35 says, don't be afraid, just believe. That gives me strength. That gives me hope. That gives me joy when I think about that. Because it's so easy to be afraid. It's so easy to be fearful when we've got other voices, whether it's from ourselves or other people helping at us, when Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. So I want to end with a cool illustration. One night, a house was caught on fire and a young boy was forced to jump off the roof. The father stood at the ground with his outstretched arms. But the boy couldn't see it because of all the smoke that was going through. And all the boy could see was the flame, the smoke and the blackness, but couldn't see the father. And as you can imagine, he was afraid to leave the roof. And the dad saying, jump, jump, I will catch you. But the boy saying, I can't see you. I can't see you. But the father replied, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. And so he jumped and the father caught him. 
See, sometimes when we are living in our lives, the only things that we can see are the smoke and the flames. You can't see Jesus there with us. But Jesus in this situation is saying, hey, I can see you, don't be afraid, just believe. To me, that's a powerful illustration that I can take with me when I'm going through adversity and I hope that can be the same for us as well. So let's close in prayer. Hey God, I just want to thank you for this story, this example of Jesus working through two people's lives, two different situations and two different backgrounds there, Lord. That you are a God that doesn't discriminate, that you are a God that loves everyone equally no matter where they are in life. And God, for us, it is so easy to focus on the things around us. Whether it's our own voices telling us we're not worthy or whether it's people around us saying, no, 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 you have to deal with that forever now. Or is this normal? But we know if we have the faith that you can work with us. We're not too sure when it will happen. But we've got to have the faith that you do. As you say, don't be afraid, just believe. And if we have questions about you in our mind right now, again, let us bring them to, towards you. Let us not be afraid to talk to you or confront you about these things. Lord, whatever we're dealing with currently, whether it's small or big, let us put it in your hands. And we just pray these things in your mighty and wonderful name. Amen.